morning. This is week 12 of the introduction to the culture of the 19th century and today I'd like to talk with you about Victorian sexuality. Um, for many people, especially those who are not very familiar with uh, history or social history, when they hear the word Victorian, the adjective, or when they hear about somebody um, described as being Victorian, um, very often the first thing that comes to their mind is sexual repression or some sort of sexual hypocrisy. And, uh, well, perhaps it's not 100% true, but there is definitely a grain of truth in it, um, mostly because our own contemporary images and stereotypes and norms concerning sexuality mostly go back to the 19th century and uh, they have been influenced by the Victorian way of thinking. Um, so let me start first with uh, a name of an intellectual historian philosopher that uh, hopefully by now you, uh, you already know, that is Michel Foucault. He uh, described himself as the historian of ideas and uh, he was always interested professionally in his writing career um, in institutions of power within the society. So uh, he wrote books on uh, some institutions such as prisons, uh, schools, insane asylums and uh, the last book, multi-volume book, that he uh, wanted to write uh, was entitled The History of Sexuality. Unfortunately, he did not finish it. He just managed to write the first volume and then he died. But, luckily for us, the first volume was uh, uh, at least uh, partially, the first chapter was about the Victorian attitudes towards sexuality. And it is uh, given quite an interesting title, subtitle, We the Victorians. We the Victorians means um, that the contemporary people, and he was writing that in the 1980s, I think, uh, so the contemporary people share a lot of their views on sexuality with the Victorians, or they derive their um, uh, their way of thinking, the stereotypes and other things from the Victorians. And if Michel Foucault is remembered for one thing, is for the uh, popularization of the term discourse. Discourse means a way of speaking, but uh, um, in a more theoretical sense, it means a specific language, a specific way of approaching a certain subject, usually a difficult subject for the society, from some sort of specific perspective. So in terms of uh, sexuality in the Victorian context, Foucault observed that there would be three discourses in which to approach this subject and it would be um, a moral discourse, very often based in uh, religious uh, teachings, mostly of the Church of England, so this kind of moralizing religious discourse. The other would be the medical discourse, so taken from the um, developments of, uh, of the science of medicine. And the third one would be the legal discourse. So uh, most problems in Victorian society concerning sexuality would be discussed in one or more, sometimes all, of these discourses. So through the perspective either from the, of, uh, of Christian morality or of medicine or of the law. So uh, something that was not within the norm would be uh, condemned either as a sin against morality or as, a, as an unhealthy thing, some sort of deviation, some sort of madness, illness. Um, so something that medicine perhaps be interested in. Uh, and uh, finally, as a crime, deserving of punishment. So, um, 
if these were the verdicts given to anyone or any behavior beyond the norm, what was the norm? And in the 19th century, and especially in the Victorian period, the norm is extremely narrow. This is one of the characteristic issues about Victorian culture, Victorian morality. Uh, the norm is, um, uh, is very difficult to attain. So it's not the... Well, the ideal is the norm, or rather the norm becomes the ideal. Uh, so uh, rather than... Um, consider, I don't know, some human frailty and uh, and the impossibility of living up to extremely high standards. The Victorians treated the ideal as the norm, something that should be expected of, and uh, um, uh, forced upon everybody in the society. And what was the ideal? So. What was the norm? The norm was a middle class married couple with children. That's the norm. The, this is the only context in which any sort of sexual behavior or any issue um, concerning sexuality would be treated as normal, healthy, legal good. Heterosexual middle class couple with children. If you did not fit this category and you had anything in, in your life to do with sexuality, you were either a pervert or um, a criminal or at least a sinner. So that's the Victorian frame of mind. That's the background of Victorian morality. So who would be beyond the norm? Almost everybody. People who are not married, um, those who were too young, so children, they were very suspicious. We'll talk about it in a little while. So men and women who are not married, so spinsters and bachelors, uh, they might be uh, uh, um, suspected homosexuals, so people of other um, sexual orientations than the, the heterosexual orientation, they would definitely uh, be uh, beyond the, uh, the norm. Uh, also, people who are not in the middle class. So the aristocracy would be suspicious anyway. The working class would be suspicious. Their poverty might, for example, lead uh, some, uh, some women and also some men to prostitution. So that's very problematic. And if you had too much money, this might loosen your morals as well. So yes, the middle class uh, was, uh, was there. Uh, also people who had no children, for whatever reason, medical or because it was their decision not to have children, so they used contraception. Contraception was against the law. You could end up in prison for distributing information about birth control. So this is Victorian sexuality. If you are not within the norm, you are a pervert, a criminal and a sinner and the norm is set so high that, I don't know, 10% of the society would really fit it? Some more, perhaps another 10 or 15% would convincingly pretend to fit it? And the rest would be living with the stigma. That's your Victorian sexuality. So, um, I would say that those who say that the uh, uh, adjective Victorian denotes sexual repression or some sort of problems in this area, they are probably right. Let's now look at some, uh, some examples. So uh, let's start with the children. children. Children are supposed to be innocent and pure and angelic, perhaps when they are babies, but then they start to grow up and they go through puberty and they start to take interest in 
some functions of the body. So this may lead, for example, to the unhealthy um, impulse to touch themselves at night. What do you do if you are a Victorian and you are a loving parent or a careful teacher of a young child, especially a teenage child? Mostly boys, but not only. Uh, so there is a, an impossible, huge scare of masturbation in Victorian uh, medical writing, in Victorian pedagogy writing. Uh, this is one of the biggest problems for the Victorians. The, the kids who touch themselves at night. So what do you do? You design schools, those prestigious schools for elite boys, so the, the public schools, the dormitories, in such a way as to reduce the danger of masturbation. So the boys are never allowed to have their own bedrooms. They, even the very, very um, rich children from extremely rich families, they uh, sleep in large um, halls with lots of other students and uh, the halls are supervised by caretakers uh, just in case there is something sexual going on. Like masturbation, or worse even, homosexuality. Um, they might breed some other future sexual problems like uh, the physical punishment uh, was supposed to uh, promote in many people in adult life a particular um, a particular pleasure in being spanked and in uh, this kind of sadomasochistic uh, games and uh, this was ridiculed all around Europe. It was called the English disease or the English perversion. Uh, so um, to, be, to be dominated by somebody spanking you. This was supposed to derive from public schools. But otherwise uh, it's the, uh, the scare of the masturbation. You might ask yourself why? Why on earth world were they so obsessed with something that, at least to our knowledge, is um, basically natural and harmless unless it becomes some sort of obsession uh, for, uh, for a person. <clears throat> this goes back to Victorian medicine and some, <clears throat> now we know, mistaken ideas about the economy of bodily fluids. The common medical consent in the 19th century, going back to earlier times, was that semen in a male is produced from blood. So there was even like a, 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 a ratio that a pint of blood is, is used by the body to produce an ounce of semen. So it's very valuable fluid and should not be wasted. There goes your Victorian obsession with not wasting anything like food or, uh, or <clears throat> household refuse. You shouldn't waste the semen, you see, because it weakens your body. It's like spilling your blood in vain. If you do it in, <coughs> in good uh, purpose, like to produce more people, Yes, this is good and this is, this is something that should be done within marriage to make more children, but not for the release of sexual tension. So, um, all kinds of, th th there were all kinds of medical um, publications, pamphlets, uh, scaring people that masturbation causes uh, all kinds of diseases from, uh, from acne to uh, tuberculosis, cancer, uh, schizophrenia, and death, basically death, blindness. Blindness was very, uh, very often added to. So if you were a parent, you really wanted your child to be spared such huge uh, dangers. Uh, that is why for children who did not go to those uh, uh, boarding schools, uh, some Old inventions were reinvented, like chastity belts, so metal panties for children to be uh, wearing at night. So they would protect their sexual organs from um, immoral touch. 
This was mostly for the boys because, well, the male body produces semen that can be spilled in such a way. But uh, um, gradually the girls were also included. So, so uh, if the girls touch themselves, they might also be given chastity belts. In the most extreme cases, in the Victorian environment, they might be taken to a doctor who would diagnose hysteria so this very specific form of female madness and in some most drastic, luckily rare cases, um, they, might, they might recommend a surgical procedure which is very similar to the practice of female circumcision. So basically all the external organs would be removed from the, uh, from the body surgically. So you can imagine it's well, it sounds funny, it sounds stupid and, and kind of silly, but it could really result in uh, permanent mutilation, in uh, traumas and, and basically um, human tragedy. So uh, that's one thing. And they all had good intentions. You cannot really say that the Victorians did it out of cruelty. They had good intentions. Probably that's the worst of it. So, what else? Um, homosexuality, which was also somehow connected to those uh, public schools, which of course were for boys only, so they did not, uh, they did not um, uh, promote any healthy contacts, friendships, or even some sort of social interaction between boys and girls from the same social sphere. If you were a boy, you would have boy colleagues from your school days. If you uh, were a girl, you would have girl colleagues from your, uh, from your school days. Uh, basically, there was no notion, and especially the, in, the, in the higher sections of the society, there was no notion of um, schools for boys and girls so that they would interact socially, they would basically form friendships and, and normal human contacts. So uh, one uh, way of, uh, of, of kind of result of uh, this situation was of course that uh, um, uh, boys formed uh, homosexual attachments uh, or at least very strong friendships. There is a there is a word. It was used by a, a literary historian uh, and scholar, Eve Kosowski Sedgwick. She postulated a word homosocial. Homosocial, in terms of, of the Victorian culture, she used it in, the, in reference to Victorian culture, meant uh, the society of men, the uh, social groups, the social elites consisting of men only. It doesn't have to have a sexual component, so it's not the same as homosexual. Uh, it's more about uh, intense friendships, uh, close um, contacts, uh, I know, professional contacts, uh, the kind of tutoring, mentoring uh, arrangements, so that for many graduates of the public schools uh, Women were not partners for anything in life. They were not um, romantic partners. They were not intellectual partners. Um, they were not, you know, kind of friend material. Uh, you might marry to produce children, but that was basically all. You'd spend all your free time interacting with men, going to men's clubs where women would not be admitted, cultivating friendships with men. To a certain degree um, this was also uh, possible among women, especially those who went to school. They would also form very close friendships and sometimes these friendships would last um, for a lifetime. They, they would very often be maintained through uh, through correspondence, but of course um, the um, gender roles being so different for men and women, it was more visible and more socially kind of resonant in uh, in men. Uh, regarding homosexuality, uh, especially the men who never married, because most 
people married, even homosexual people married. If you think of Oscar Wilde, he had a wife and uh, and children, so um, probably for many uh, many people who are not straight, um, marriage was like a different thing in life than, than let's say romantic or sexual um, relationships. It was about status, it was about um, legacy and uh, and um, social position rather than anything to do with personal motivation. So um, for most of the 19th century homosexuality, male homosexuality was a serious crime. So serious that it carried the risk of being hanged. However, for the vast majority of the 19th century, nobody was hanged for being gay. Because first of all, they needed to be caught in the act. Uh, it had to involve um, anal intercourse. Uh, it's very difficult to actually prove something like that. Uh, so that uh, um, nobody was really interested in making martyrs of, uh, of gay men. So there was a threat and of course they had to hide uh, their orientation, their preferences, their relationships. But uh, uh, the threat was more theoretical than practical. Then in 1885 there was uh, uh, an amendment of the law. It's called the Labochet Amendment of the uh, criminal law. Uh, named after the member of parliament who proposed it, 1885. And uh, he observed that uh, this law was too severe, it was too harsh, uh, that it's absolutely inhuman to, uh, to hang people for uh, homosexual behaviour. And uh, the law should be, uh, should be made uh, much less severe. So rather than a uh, death penalty, it should be just one or two years in prison. Sounds humane, doesn't it? And here the practice and the theory go against each other. So in theory, this was humane and uh, much more um, relaxed than the law before. In practice, nobody objected against sending gay men to prison for a year or two. So here we have the, uh, the um, relaxation of the law, making the law less strict and less severe, resulting in significantly more convictions. And here we have the case of, uh, of um, Oscar Wilde, uh, who was uh, brought to, um, to court uh, in the 90s, 1890s. Um, uh, he, was, uh, he was sued by the aristocratic father of uh, one of his uh, lovers. Um, Lord Alfred Douglas was the name of the lover and uh, the father caught some letters, he got angry and he sued uh, Oscar Wilde uh, for being a sodomite. A sodomite, it's a Victorian word, sodomy was um, uh, a kind of Victorian term for male homosexuality. He actually wrote the, na the word with, uh, with a spelling mistake, but it doesn't really matter. What resulted uh, was uh, a very famous conviction uh, when uh, Oscar Wilde was sent to prison. He was released, uh, but uh, he was basically a broken man. His health suffered, uh, his um, mental health was basically in shutters. Um, he survived the prison but uh, he emigrated from, uh, from Britain, he moved to France and he died just a few years later. So you might say that by ways of relaxing the law, they actually made it more um, drastic because uh, it was actually enforced. Later in the 20th century, uh, century the same law was uh, used against uh, Alan Turing. You may remember this uh, computer 
scientist and uh, it actually drove him to suicide so um, this was really a, a, a tragic tale, a tragic case. Um, the last thing concerning homosexuality, there were some scandals, there were some rumours. There was a very famous story called the Cleveland Street Scandal involving uh, the eldest grandson of Queen Victoria. This was a scandal uh, involving a illegal gang um, operating an underground system of um, male prostitutes. So young men, teenage boys, um, working as uh, as prostitutes, pretending to be post boys or delivery boys, uh, and one of the one of the sponsors, one of the clients um, implicated in this case was a grandson of Queen Victoria, Prince Eddie. You may want to look him up. A very interesting and strange character, uh, sub supposed by some to be Jack the Ripper. So, of course, uh, uh, the story of Jack the Ripper, the, the, the notorious murderer and, uh, and uh, especially, of course, uh, the killer of prostitutes in late Victorian London. Uh, so, um, yeah, we'll continue in a moment.